Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today, we're gonna to take a deep dive looking at the Emmylou Harris album, Luxury Liner. This is part of a new series I'm going to do on albums you should know. So this is gonna be a fun one. I'm gonna talk about the players on it, the producer, uh, the recording of it, uh, some significant things as far as the, uh, the playing and tones and such that are used on it. And uh, yeah, this is just a, a favorite album of mine. And it's one that, uh, golly, has been on regular rotation for over 30 years for me. So I'm gonna have fun here and I hope you do too. First off, I need to thank the sponsor of today's episode, GuitarEffectsPedals.com. The owner, Ryan Nixon, and I have been friends for over 15 years, and I've been doing business with him all that time, and he is wonderful to deal with. He carries all the major brands, and uh, you know whether it's boutique or more uh, you know, bigger names like Strymon and UA and True Tone, and uh, he's a, a pleasure to deal with. He has, a, of course, a location here in Nashville, and also you can find him on Reverb and eBay, and uh, a wonderful guy to deal with. And unlike a lot of other sellers, he enjoys uh, trade-ins. And so I love going down there with a, a box of unused pedals or an amp or something like that and coming home with some new stuff to play with. So go check out guitareffectspedals.com. Thanks, Ryan. All right, let's dive in. And uh, just we're going to do like a really brief background we're going to do like the nickel version of the emilio harris story just to kind of get up to uh, to this album so emilio was born in birmingham alabama she uh, got into folk music she was in new york city again this is the fast version uh, and she had a record deal with jubilee and she put on an album called gliding bird and it was very much a folk album with her kind of channeling one of her heroes, Joan Baez. Uh, the album did not really go anywhere. She kind of has disavowed the album and uh, yeah, and she went back to waiting tables and she was discovered by Chris Hillman of the Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers who suggested that Graham Parsons use her as a, a duet partner and so Graham uh, flew her out to Los Angeles and she recorded two albums with Graham. Of course, Graham died before the second album could be released and uh, the uh, management and the label decided to move forward with Emmy Lou as kind of an artist and in the same vein and Graham had put together a, uh, a band for the recording that was kind of uh, all stars of country rock and they also included to uh, you know, Elvis players, uh, James Burton and Glenn D. Harden. And of course, he also had a, a bevy of other guys from Bernie Ledden to uh, you know, all sorts of Bud, Buddy Emmons and all sorts of great players on those, those two Graham solo records. So they went forward and they worked with uh, a producer named Brian Hearn from Canada. And Brian had, uh, had worked with Ann Murray and was a great producer and so their first collaboration Emmy and Brian was uh, this album uh, Pieces of the Sky and what an amazing first album again because she doesn't uh, recognize Gliding Bird has a, a ton of great tunes uh, some of them written by her uh, her kind of a singing partner her Graham Rodney Crowell and of course a bunch of great playing by uh, uh, James Burton and uh, not yet the hot band, because uh, you, you don't have that, that aggregation of players together yet. Uh, it's her second album, so when she's gonna tour behind that album, she puts together the hot band. And the original hot band was Rodney Crowell on rhythm guitar and harmony vocals and also contributing a lot of great songs. You had uh, Hank DeVito on pedal steel guitar, John Ware on drums, AKA the Shuffle King. Of course, James Burton on lead guitar. Uh, and you had Glendy Harden on piano that uh, along with Elvis had come from Elvis. Uh, and that were actually touring with Elvis and they would work around Elvis's schedule. 
And you had Emory Gordy Jr. on bass, who had been working with uh, Elvis and was famous for his bass part on Burning Love. Um, so that was the original hot band. And they began touring and they recorded this album called Elite Hotel. And this is a fabulous sophomore effort by Emmy with Brian Ahern still producing. And uh, there are some live cuts on here, including Ooh Las Vegas. This is another fabulous album that you ought to check out. Well, after this album was released, they were, uh, they were touring. And again, they were having to tour around Elvis's schedule because of course they had uh, two players that were working in both bands. Well, there came a conflict and Glenn D. Harden, the pianist, he decided to stay with Amy Lou, but uh, James decided to stay with Elvis. And so at that point, uh, they, they had a little bit of time and they started looking, uh, looking for Albert Lee because uh, Glenn D. Harden had already worked with Albert in uh, the crickets. So the, uh, and of course this is, we're talking about the post Buddy Holly uh, crickets that had uh, Sonny Curtis and of course the original bass player and drummer kind of running that band. And so Albert had been a part of that and so had Glenn D. Harden. And so uh, Albert's name quickly came up as a replacement for James and uh, before they could really uh, have a rehearsal or anything like that on one of the shows that they were going to do still with James Burton, James was sick. And so Albert was thrown into uh, being the guitarist in the hot band. And, uh, and yeah, and they played, they played shows. And before he knew it, he was a full-time hot band member replacing his hero, James Burton. So, this was, uh, this was a tough thing. Uh, you know, one, James, Amy Lou has even said that James Burton really uh, helped put the hot in hot band and that there were people that came to their shows to see James. Also, uh, Albert is a huge James Burton fan. In fact, just to kind of bring this home, uh, recently I was emailed by Albert Lee and the reason he emailed me was because he had seen my episode where I talked about James Burton's 52 Telecaster and all the changes that it had gone through, being from its original kind of butterscotch color to, uh, to being you know, red with a white pit guard as it is now. And he, uh, Albert was, was kind enough to send me an email saying how much he enjoyed the episode. And also he saw the episode that I had done on, on, on him, on Albert. And uh, so, there was also the pressure of, uh, here's Albert Lee, who is replacing one of his biggest, you know, influences and in guitar heroes. That's a, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from, uh, also from the other guys in the band, because uh, they were used to hearing James's playing and his tone and everything. And even though Albert plays a Telecaster and plays in a similar style, I mean, he's not identical to James. And so, Albert has said that there was some pressure from some of the other band members of really wanting him to play as closely as possible to James's original parts on those first two albums. So it was a huge blessing you know, for Albert when they recorded the next album, which is the subject of today's episode, Luxury Liner. So this was the first one to feature Albert on uh, on lead guitar and uh, it was a uh, you know kind of a, a changeover I think one of the uh, some you know reviewers and such have have noted that this was the first Amy Lou record that didn't have a, a Beatles cover on it and uh, but it uh, it does have uh, some fun covers it you know as, as per usual it has some Graham covers and you know a tune that she uh, co-wrote with Rodney and such but uh, yeah Let's, uh, let's kind of dive in. Of course, Brian Ahern was, uh, again, the producer. Uh, he and Emmy would end up marrying a year or two later. Um, they recorded it using the Enactron truck, which was this huge mobile truck 
that had a uh, you know a mixing console and and recording gear in it, and then they would rent a house, in which they did in in Los Angeles, and they would uh, run cables into the house, and they would record in different rooms in in the homes that they would uh, they would rent, and they would basically use the house as a recording studio, and then they would have the control room and tape machines and such in the Enactron truck that was outside on the street. So, uh, the first tune on the album is Luxury Liner, which is a Graham Parsons tune that he did with the International Submarine Band. It's here that we really need to give praise to Brian Ahern. Of course, I love his production, I love the way he mixes, I love the sounds he gets. Um, but this tune really shows off some of his arranging skills in that he, one, changed the melody partially and the chord changes on it. So if you hear the original version that Graham did on the International Submarine Band versus, you know, the, uh, the version on this album, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty different. The, uh, you know, the original Graham version with the Submarine Band sounds like it could have been a monkey's tune or something like that. And uh, I mean, a cool monkey's tune, but it, it doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't have the kind of the power and such that, uh, that Emmy's version of it has. A uh, couple really important notes is the opening guitar that you hear on it, the diggy 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 part is being played by Brian Ahern. So he's playing electric guitar or an acoustic guitar with an electric pickup on it through an echoplex. And he's playing that line because the band was having trouble getting the groove that he wanted. And so to keep the band playing the groove that he wanted to stick to, he plays that kind of diggy diggy part throughout the song. And that's kind of the core. And then of course you, you get the great uh, drumming by uh, John Ware, the Shuffle King. And uh, it's a, a really, really great song. Of course, you know, you have uh, Albert's wonderful electric guitar parts. You hear his kind of quasi-Travis picking on there. You hear his fast single note lines on the solo. The, uh, the solo was made up from a couple of passes. So, you know, of course they did some, uh, this is before Pro Tools. So they were, uh, you know, cutting up some tape and they put a couple different passes together to uh, create the, uh, the solo on there. And the tune really became Albert's uh, showpiece live because, of course, James had had the tune Ooh Las Vegas off the last album that was kind of his song to, uh, to show off with. And, uh, of course, Luxury Liner became the vehicle for Albert to really stretch out and uh, play long solos and, uh, and really amaze crowds with his uh, just amazing touch, melodic sense, and tone. And... Uh, he used his uh, 53 Tele, and uh, yeah, just a fantastic sound. The, uh, the next song on the record is Poncho and Lefty, which of course is a tune written by Towns Van Zant. To me, this version of Poncho and Lefty is the definitive version. I know there are a lot of fans of the Willie and Haggard version of the tune, and uh, I, I love it, and I love Reggie Young's you know, gut string solo on there where he's kind of channeling Willie. But uh, to me, this is, this is the, the best version of the song there's ever been. And uh, it's just beautifully done. It has an amazing B-Bender solo done by Albert Lee. Uh, has wonderful harmony vocals by Albert and Rodney Crowell. And uh, it's just a, a really great tune. You also have, um, uh, here you have the uh, guesting of Mickey Raphael. If you're not familiar with Mickey Raphael, Mickey is the uh, wonderful harmonica player with Willie Nelson from the beginning up until today. And Mickey is one of the uh, great guest artists that's on a number of the cuts on the Luxury Liner, and he really helps take uh, Poncho and Lefty up, up a notch with his uh, wonderful kind of almost string part sounding harmonica work. Uh, Albert is not using his, his own B-Bender guitar. It was, uh, his, his was stolen. So he had a Dave Evans pull string with a butcher block body. And it was on an equipment truck that was stolen. 
And so all the guys in, in Emilou's band uh, lost, uh, <laughs> lost their gear. And, but a fan was able to eventually find the guitar, buy it back, and give it back to, to, to Albert. So Albert did get his guitar back, but none of the other guys got their, got their gear back. So that is on that cut, that's not that guitar, it's actually Bob Warford's Telecaster that uh, he got from Clarence White. And so Albert borrowed Bob Warford's uh, Telecaster with a B-bender on it, and they used that for Poncho and Lefty. The next tune, of course, is Making Believe, which is a great cover, it's a great version of the tune that, uh, that I love. And uh, one of the, besides Albert Lee's wonderful solo on there, Another real highlight of the tune is the uh, the guest harmony work of the great Herb Peterson, who of course was in the Desert Rose Band and John Denver and others. And just listening to his high harmony on uh, Making Believe is just, uh, wow, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, next up is uh, You're Supposed to Be Feeling Good, which is a Rodney Crowell tune. And here we have uh, James coming back and playing on. So James plays on two cuts on the record. And uh, so this is one of them. This is the first one. And uh, this is another one that uh, features some really great playing by Mickey Raphael on the harmonica. Uh, James Burton plays some wonderful uh, guitar fills and such uh, using a phaser. So it's probably either a phase 90 or a, a small stone phaser. And uh, Rodney Crowell's playing really good uh, rhythm guitar part, also going through a phaser. Uh, also, uh, I have to spotlight Glenn D. Harden. Glenn D. Harden's playing Fender Rhodes on there and playing some, uh, his part is really kind of gluing everything together. It's, a, it's a, a wonderful track. To finish out side two is I'll Be Your San Antonio Rose, which is a tune written by Susanna Clark, who of course at the time was married to uh, Guy Clark, and Suzanne was a, a wonderful songwriter in, in her own right. And I'll Be Your San Antonio Rose is a wonderful vehicle for uh, you know, the great honky-tonk piano playing of Glenn D. Harden. Albert Lee kind of playing his, uh, kind of like his own version of, of James Burton honky-tonk stuff. And again, he's not copying James in any way, but kind of doing his own thing. And Ricky Skaggs, is playing uh, you know, fantastic uh, fiddle work on there. It's a great tune, and uh, Albert and Hank DeVito play a wonderful twin you know, turnaround that's, uh, that's really nice in it. Side two kicks off with uh, You Never Can Tell, C'est La Vie by Chuck Berry. Of course, most of you are probably familiar with the song from, uh, you know, if you're if not a Chuck Berry fan, then you probably uh, saw it and heard it in uh, Pulp Fiction, where uh, John Travolta and Uma Thurman are, are dancing in the, uh, the dance contest. So, great tune, it's a great arrangement of the song, and uh, yeah, and of course, uh, the reason, you know, the reason I became a big fan of the, the bender work on there, you know, of course, you know, Albert's using a B bender on this tune, is because he basically played the whole solo on his Starlux video that he did in the early 1980s. And uh, I learned that solo note for note and my college roommates can still hum the solo even though they don't even play guitar. <laughs> uh, the next tune is uh, When I Stop Dreaming, which is a great Leuven Brothers tune. And here we get wonderful harmony vocals by uh, Dolly Parton. And if you just would have added in Linda Ronstadt, it sounds like it could have been you know, on a, a trio album. And who knows, this might have been a track from their, uh, you know, the, the trio album that was never released and they removed Linda's vocal and got Fayou, you know, Starling on there. But uh, it's wonderful, especially Mike Aldridge's uh, Dobro work is wonderful. And then, uh, uh, of course, another Mickey Raphael harmonica solo that really takes the tune up a notch. Uh, then you have uh, the A.P. Carter tune, Hello Stranger, which uh, you know, features Albert playing mandolin. And this is one of the reasons why I and, and you know, a lot of guys got interested in mandolin from seeing Albert Lee play mandolin because you know, it was like, oh wait, here's this whole other color and that they can bring to a band and uh, you, know, you don't have to be playing electric guitar all the time. And so 
Yeah, again, great old AP Carter tune, Hello Stranger. Uh, next up is another Graham Parsons tune, this one co-written with Chris Etheridge called She. And uh, this has Albert playing uh, wonderful lyrical guitar parts, and you also get some nice Hank DeVito steel work. Uh, to me, one of the, the things that really struck me in kind of listening to this critically was that this is probably the, uh, one of the few Amy Lou tunes to not have any harmony vocals on it. So they're just her lead vocals and that's it. And uh, it's a wonderful tune. And it's also fun to compare this with the original version that, uh, that Graham recorded that has James Burton. So it's, it's fun to kind of compare the kind of fills that Albert did that are very lyrical and of course the, uh, the stuff that James did, which, uh, yeah, some people have said it sounds like kind of country soul. So uh, both really great versions of the song. And the album ends with Tulsa Queen. And this is a tune uh, co-written by Emmy and Rodney Crowell. And it's a train song. And uh, I, I really love it. And, and one of the reasons I love it is because of the bass. And so I found out that Emery Gordy Jr., of course the bass player with the hot band and on this entire album, he used an interesting method to get a doubled bass sound. So what he was trying to reproduce was the sound of a bass and a tic-tac playing together, but he didn't want to play it twice. So what he did was he had a Hagstrom eight-string bass. Now, I know what you're thinking. No, but he took off four of the strings. So he just used you know, four of the strings, not all eight of them, and he ran it through an EQ and he put all the lows going to a direct box, and that was like the bass sound. And then all the highs were run to a Fender Basement amp with some echo on it and with the treble turned all the way up, and that's the tic-tac sound. So in that way, you get this really, really great bass sound that has really low lows, and then it has this, this tic-tac, which I mean, he also, I think he played it with a pick and uh, you get this really great doubled bass sound. And I don't think uh, Emery Gordy Jr. gets enough love for his wonderful bass work, whether it's Burn in Love with Elvis or on Albert's version of Country Boy or uh, you know all these you know, different tunes that uh, Emery played on. And of course, Emery uh, you know, would produce uh, Patti Loveless and of course they were, they are still married to this day. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. Such a such a, an amazing uh, album, and uh, like I said, I listen to it all the time, and it was a huge influence on me. This is the album that got me into both country music and the Telecaster. So uh, I uh, I had been on a a trip with my family, and I was driving back home with just my dad. And we stopped in San Antonio, Texas at a record store called Apple Music that was on San Pedro. And of course, the store is no longer there. And I'd heard that Albert had played with this, you know, singer named Amy Lou Harris. I'd never heard her before in my life. And uh, again, this was in 1990. And you know, I went through and I found this album. This is it. This is the one uh, in the record shop. And I saw Albert's name on the back on the liner notes, and I bought it. And it was about a three-hour drive back home, and I was just looking at it, looking at the liner notes, seeing that James Burton was also on two cuts, and looking at the uh, this collage by Dan Reeder, the photographer. And there's this wonderful, you know, little photo of uh, Albert Lee holding his 53 Telecaster and all the guys in the band and all the guests on it. And uh, yeah, I was just blown away. And this got me into, you know, Ricky Skaggs and Merle Haggard and Buck Owens and everything else. This, this album was my gateway to country music and again to the Telecaster. And uh, of course, my first Telecaster, you know, because this was, this was 1990, uh, my first Telecaster was the uh, James Burton signature model. So I was a black and gold Paisley, and I think I have a, a photo here that I'll show of myself as, uh, uh, you know, I guess I'm, you know, you know, 19, 20 years old, something like that in college. And uh, 
you know, with my Zach strap on and uh, with my James Burton Paisley Telecaster. So yeah, very important album. Uh, go out and listen to it and enjoy it. And uh, thank you for watching. And again, I need to thank GuitarEffectsPedals.com and Ryan Nixon for sponsoring this episode. Go see him for all your pedals and accessory needs. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.